Welcome. We're very pleased that you can join us on today's webinar looking at emergent situations in MRI. My name is Colin Robertson. I'm Senior VP with Metrosense, and we're excited to be hosting this webinar with Bill Faulkner and Kristen Harrington. For those of you less familiar with Metrosense, we're the leading provider of advanced magnetic detection technologies. Our Ferragard ferromagnetic detection systems are protecting patients and staff now in 36 countries around the world. Before I hand you over to Bill and Kristen, I have a few housekeeping items to quickly cover to make sure we all get the most out of our time today. Firstly, today's session will be available on demand after this live version. Just follow the same link as you used just now. We'll also send this link out in the email you'll receive after the session. Of course, please feel free to share this with any of your colleagues who are unable to attend today. I would now like to quickly take you through the various parts of the screen you're looking at. Starting on the left side is the Q&A window. We hope you'll have lots of questions for our experts today, so please enter them here. Bill and Christian will be addressing them towards the end of this webinar, and if we don't get to your question today, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. Please understand, though, we, do, we get lots of questions asked during these webinars, so get yours in early as possible. Don't leave it until late in the session. The window in the center of the screen is where you'll see the slides throughout the webinar. If you'd like to change the sizes of any of the windows, just use the controls at the top right corner of each window. To hide or redisplay any of the individual windows, just use the buttons at the bottom of the screen. At top right, we're pleased to provide resources that can be downloaded during the webinar. Please make sure that you take a look at the infographic highlighting nine key best practices that could significantly reduce the incidence of MRI-related injuries. The final window, lower right, gives you a brief biography of Bill Faulkner and Kristen Harrington, our speakers today. Bill Faulkner has been teaching on MR for over 25 years. He's a fellow of the SMRT, and served as its first president. He's a founding board member of the American Board of Magnetic Resonance Safety and is a credentialed MR safety officer. Bill is also author of a number of MR reference texts and of course has a very busy consulting practice for radiology facilities and device companies alike. Kristen Harrington is a credentialed MR safety officer and is also a board member of the ABMRS. She has extensive experience as an MRI educator in academic medical centers and for medical device companies. Metrosense is proud to have Bill and Kristen join our MR Safety webinar faculty, and it gives me great pleasure to hand over to them now. Thank you, Colin. In this webinar, we will address MR staffing, contrast media adverse events, the emergent removal of a patient from Zone 4, for example, in the event of a code blue, and things to think about if there were to be an active fire in zone four. And finally, we will discuss strategies for managing patient anxiety and MRI. The ACR guidance document on MR safe practices addresses MR staffing. On page 10, the ACR states that except for emergent coverage, there will be a minimum of two MR technologists or one MR technologist and one other individual with the designation of MR personnel, meaning level one or level two training, in the immediate zone two through zone four MR environment. One of the staffing models we have utilized by several of our clients is in the use of MR tech aids. MR tech aids can be highly trained to perform all MR functions with the exception of screening. They can be trained to turn the room around for the next exam, screen patients, and even position patients for the exam. Using a staffing model of MRI tech and tech aid is a viable option for many facilities. Contrast media adverse events, which includes both iodinated and gadolinium-based contrast agents, are also known as type B reactions. Now, these types of reactions rarely occur and are unpredictable. And this means that they don't necessarily reoccur with a given patient. And it also means that although a patient has experienced an adverse event in the past, they may not experience one with the next administration of an agent. Gadolinium-based contrast agent adverse events are not dose-dependent, 
and they are not a true hypersensitivity reaction in that antibodies are not involved. For this reason, gadolinium-based contrast agent adverse events are classified as idiosyncratic reactions. Idiosyncratic reactions are classified as either mild, moderate, or severe. Mild adverse events include hives, runny nose, nausea and vomiting, shortness of breath, and dizziness. Moderate adverse events include persistent vomiting, diffuse urticaria, or hives, headache, facial edema, laryngeal edema, mild bronchiospasms or shortness of breath, palpitations, uh, tachycardia or bradycardia, hypertension, and abdominal cramps. Severe adverse events include life-threatening arrhythmias, for example, ventricular tachycardia, hypotension, overt bronchial spasm, laryngeal edema, pulmonary edema, seizures, syncope, and even death. According to the ACR Manual on Contrast Media version 10.3 published in 2017, the rate of gadolinium-based contrast agent adverse events when administered in the clinical setting is between 0.07% and 2.4%. Compared to other drugs, this is a very low rate. Allergic-like reactions, which includes hives or breathing difficulties, are between 0.004% and 0.7%, which is similar to that of what is seen with iodinated contrast agents. Severe life-threatening adverse events are between 0.001% and 0.01%. In order to treat patients who experience an adverse event following the administration of a gadolinium-based contrast agent, facilities should ensure that all MR Level 2 personnel should be able to assess the patient's vital signs. The following should be readily available on-site. O2, IV fluids, epinephrine, atropine, and diphenhydramine. According to the 2013 ACR guidance document, gadolinium-based contrast agents are to be administered by certified or licensed professionals under the direction of a radiologist or his or her physician designee who is personally and immediately available. This means that a physician, and not necessarily a radiologist, must be immediately available to treat an adverse event. For Medicare patients, the administration of a gadolinium-based contrast agent requires a physician provide what they describe or term as direct supervision. And as you can see, direct supervision means that a physician is immediately available to furnish assistance and direction throughout the procedure. In order to be immediately available, a physician must be interruptible meaning that they can provide immediate assistance. For example, if a radiologist is the supervising physician, but they're performing a procedure like a myelogram, then they would not be interruptible and in that they could not leave to provide assistance. Billing Medicare patients for the administration of a gadolinium-based contrast agent without providing direct supervision is classified as Medicare fraud. In this case referenced here in this Department of Justice press release, an MRI facility, its former owners, and the chief radiologist were ordered to pay $3.57 million for administering and billing for gadolinium-based contrast agents administrations without providing direct supervision. And now we've come to our first audience poll question. Uh, the question is, do you feel your facility is adequately staffed and trained to handle a serious contrast media adverse event? We'll give you a few seconds to select one of the buttons you see here on your screen. Yes, no, or only during certain hours. So go ahead and make your selection and then select submit. And here are the results.
Often, particularly in the inpatient setting, MR exams are required on critically ill patients and others which may require physiological monitoring of some type. There are situations which require physiological monitoring of a patient during an MRI procedure. These can include physically or mentally unstable patients, compromised physiological functions, if they are unable to communicate, neonatal and pediatric patients, critically ill or high-risk patients, if they are sedated or anesthetized, MR-guided interventional procedures, and potential reactions to a contrast agent or other medication. MR conditional physiological monitoring equipment can include heart rate or EKG monitors, fiber optic pulse oximeters, blood pressure monitors, respiratory rate and apnea monitors, temperature monitors, and multi-parameter mo monitoring systems. With regards to monitoring patients in MRI, MR Level 2 personnel should understand safety aspects of MRI, ensure monitoring equipment may be safely used in MRI, recognize equipment malfunctions, recognize monitoring artifacts, identify and manage adverse events, and assess vital signs. Whatever monitoring system you choose, it's important to ensure that it is a system which has been designed for use in Zone 4 and that the manufacturer has tested it and properly labeled it as MR conditional. It's also important to point out that an MRI system's EKG hardware and software is designed for data acquisition purposes and it cannot be used for, because it's not designed for, the physiologic monitoring of a patient. In many cases, the MR system's user manual will clearly state that it is that the hardware and software, the ECG components, is not to be used for physiologic monitoring of patients. When using an MR conditional device to monitor a patient's ECG during an MRI procedure, it's important to use only those ECG electrodes that have been tested and approved by the manufacturer of the device for use with their specific monitoring system. Here you see some examples of thermal injuries that resulted from the use of non-approved electrodes when monitoring a patient during an MRI exam. Physiologic monitoring was not used on this patient during his MRI exam. However, the MRI technologist failed to detect and remove ECG electrodes that were left on the patient when he was brought from his hospital room to the MRI department for his exam. In this example, MR conditional electrodes were utilized, but the specific instructions for use were not followed. Level 2 MR personnel must understand the many safety aspects of MRI, and when utilizing MR conditional equipment, they should be sure to follow the conditions of use for all items used in MRI. In the event of a severe medical emergency, such as cardiac or respiratory arrest, the ACR recommends beginning CPR while removing the patient from Zone 4 to a prospectively determined MR safe area for treatment. If the area is in Zone 3, the door to the scan room should be secured or locked so that responding non-MRI personnel cannot inadvertently enter Zone 4. It's important that the patient be removed from Zone 4 before responding non-MR personnel arrive. Quenching the magnet is not an option for a medical emergency. It's important that all MR personnel know what to do in the event of a medical emergency. If your scan table undocks, then removing a patient is pretty simple. If your scan table does not undock, then that can present a problem, particularly if there is no plan in place. Many techs in our courses tell us they don't know how they would remove a patient if they were by themselves. It's important to have a clear plan and procedure in place for the emergency removal of a patient. Facilities should hold mock codes so that all personnel can be familiar with the process. A mock code and patient removal should be established in practice for all possible staffing scenarios, 
including when a single technologist is scanning. If you perform any exams with anesthesia personnel, practice mock codes with them so they clearly understand the patient must be removed from zone four before any treatment and other CPR begins. We were told of a situation where a non-MR nurse was preventing the removal of a patient from the scan room and instead was insisting that treatment be administered in the scan room. This resulted in delaying care for that patient. This is why mock codes should involve all responding departments or personnel. It's important that non-MR personnel understand that MRI personnel are the ones in charge of their area. Mock codes should be practiced on a regular schedule. Our recommendation to our clients is two times per year. Like athletes, the more familiar MR personnel are with the procedure, the more it becomes like muscle memory. Along the lines of emergent patient care in the MRI area, take time to assess zone three, which is the area immediately adjacent to zone four. This photo shows a very unorganized supply cart in zone three. With a cart in shape like this, it is not immediately clear what can and cannot be taken into zone four. If anesthesia carts and or emergency supply carts like this are taken out of MRI and stocked by non-MR personnel, there is a danger that MR unsafe items can be brought into Zone 3 and then possibly into Zone 4. They should remain in Zone 3 with items tested and labeled by MR personnel. When performing a safety audit and risk assessment at this site, we found these items next to the scan room door. The red trash can is marked MR unsafe, but the silver can next to it is not labeled. Is it ferrous or non-ferrous? No one would know. The O2 tank next to the red can is in the cart that is tethered to the wall. The O2 cylinder was non-ferrous, but the cart is highly ferrous, which is why it was tethered. The reason we were given for having a ferrous cart was that nursing had insisted on that particular cart. This presents a highly dangerous situation. It is possible that in an emergent situation, someone could untether the cart and bring it into zone four. Non-MR personnel should have no control over what is used in the MR area. Here is the second poll question for you to answer. The question is, does your facility hold mock codes which include the emergent removal of a patient? The answers are yes, more than once a year, yes, annually, not routinely, or no. I'll give you a few seconds to select your choice and then select the Submit button in the bottom right-hand corner. And here are the answers to the second poll question, which was, does your facility hold mock codes, which includes the emergent removal of a patient? Let's now move on to the subject of a magnet quench. Helium, as you'll recall, is not stable as a liquid. In order to maintain its liquid state, helium must be at a temperature of at least 4 Kelvin, which is approximately minus 452.47 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to maintain that low of a temperature, the vessel or the cryostat within the magnet that contains the magnet coils and the liquid helium must be vacuum sealed. If the vacuum were to be removed, then the temperature within the cryostat is going to rise. Helium will boil at 4.2 Kelvin, which is approximately minus 452.11 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's going to expand at a ratio of approximately 1 to 750. This means for one liter of liquid helium, it would expand to approximately 750 liters of helium gas. Now, if all goes as designed, the helium gas will escape through the pipes and the ductwork and vent to the outside of the facility, as seen in this photo here. A quench can be initiated manually and may be intentional for several reasons. Because of the various inherent risks that are associated with a quench, which we're going to detail shortly, the circumstances in which a quench may be necessary should be well defined by site policies and procedures and specifically written for that MRI facility. 
In the event of a quench, all persons should leave or be removed from the room prior to the quench. And following the initiation of the quench, remember that it can take several minutes for the field to be completely removed. So it's imperative that personnel and ferrous items not be allowed into Zone 4, back into the scan room, until Level 2 MR personnel can determine that the field has been removed. And because a quench is generally a rare occurrence, it's important to review quench policies and procedures with all MRI personnel at least annually. In the event of an unplanned or spontaneous quench, all persons should immediately be evacuated from Zone 4. Patients and other non-MRI personnel should be moved out of the immediate area, preferably into Zone 2. MR personnel should secure access to Zone 4 until it can be determined that the field is no longer present. Again, it's important to have a clearly defined and specific policy and procedure pertaining to a quench, both planned and unplanned. If the quench ventilation system performs as intended, the large volume of helium gas will be vented to the outside of the facility. However, in most quench situations, some amount of helium will vent to the scan room. In one of the videos we have available for you in the resource section, you can see some helium escaping into the scan room. Some MR scan rooms are constructed with a secondary passive ventilation system in the event the primary ventilation system were to fail. In a failure of the primary ventilation system, all of the helium gas would escape into the scan room. As the pressure inside the scan room would rapidly increase, the secondary or passive ventilation system would provide a means for the helium gas to escape the scan room. Although helium gas is not toxic, it will displace the oxygen. If the primary ventilation system were to fail, exfiscation is possible, particularly if there were no secondary ventilation mechanism present to prevent the helium gas from filling the scan room. In the event of a large amount of helium gas venting into the scan room, the pressure inside the room would increase quickly and significantly. In the situation of an inward swinging scan room door, a pressure lock could prevent the door from being opened. Remember that the expansion ratio of helium is approximately 1 to 750. This means 1 liter of liquid helium will expand into 750 liters of helium gas. When full, MR magnets can contain upwards of 1,000 liquid liters of helium gas. If that were to heat and expand, the result would be over 750,000 liters of helium gas. Again, in the event of a failure of the primary quench ventilation system, all of this could vent into the scan room. The formula for pressure is force divided by area. The pressure on the scan room door could be obviously tremendous. This photo was taken following a quench. Now, this was a spontaneous quench that occurred during a patient exam. When the quench occurred, the primary ventilation system ductwork within the scan room at the top of the magnet collapsed immediately and the entire volume of helium gas began to fill the room quite rapidly. Well, immediately, the scanning technologist went to remove the patient from the room. In this facility, the scan room door opened inward. And due to that significant increase in pressure acting against the scan room door, the technologist was not able to open the door. A second technologist grabbed a chair and threw it into the glass window between the control room and the scan room. Now, this eliminated the pressure lock, and the technologist was able to enter the scan room. Well, by this time, the cloud of helium gas had nearly completely filled the scan room, and the patient had already begun to try and get out of the scanner, and as you can imagine, they were very frightened. Well, when the technologist reached the table in the patient, neither one could see due to the helium gas, and the pa patient began to panic, and the technologist was trying to get her off the table and out of the scan room. Now, because they'd both been breathing helium for a short period of time, they both became disoriented, and they wound up trapped in a corner of the scan room. They weren't able to find the scan room door. 
another technologist had to crawl in to the scan room beneath the helium cloud and got them down to the floor, and with the help of another technologist, they were able to drag them from the room. Now, helium gas is very cold, as you can imagine, so both the patient and the technologist were examined for frostbite. On the exam, the patient's eardrums were found to be ruptured. Now, this photo that you see here demonstrates the effect of the significant increase in pressure on the structural integrity of the room. This is the joint where the wall meets the ceiling directly above the scan room door. The increase in pressure was so great, it was so rapid, that before the tech was able to release the pressure by breaking the scan room window, the wall of the scan room was pushed out some two and a half inches. Uh, I was on site shortly after this quench, and I was able to see, looking up in that crack, the wall studs and the nails pulled away from the frame. At sites which have no secondary ventilation mechanism, it may be advisable to have some means available to break the scan room window in the event of a pressure lock. In this photo here, you see that the site has chosen the Louisville slugger option. This incident occurred in Mumbai, India in 2014. According to the news reports, a ward boy brought a ferrous oxygen tank into the scan room. The technologist became pinned at his pelvis at the bore of the magnet. Apparently, the ward boy was also pinned in some way, likely attempting to hold onto the E-cylinder. Both were pinned for nearly four hours. It seems the quench unit was not working. My understanding is that it was not electrically connected. They had to remain pinned until the field engineer arrived and quenched the magnet. The technologist sustained, among other injuries, a fractured pelvis and ruptured urinary bladder. The ward boy sustained an elbow fracture. The quench pipes and associated ductwork should be inspected annually to ensure they are structurally sound and not obstructed. Here are several images of the external portion of the quench pipe. Note that in some instances, they're not easily accessible while others are. And so for the accessible pipes, warning signs should be prominently posted. Ideally, for the accessible pipes, such as those which exit onto a roof area, some type of restricting fencing should be employed. So in summary, with regard to the quench pipes and the associated duct work, they should not exit into a publicly accessible area. One facility we visited uh, had their quench pipes exiting into an area where everyone stood around and smoked. They should uh, point downward and have a covering that would prevent animals, like birds and other such animals, from entering. Warning signs should be posted and restrictive fencing around it, it, it should be employed if that's necessary. The pipes and the associated ductwork should be inspected annually to make sure that they are structurally intact and free of any type of obstruction. We will next look at issues relating to an active fire in Zone 3 and or Zone 4. It's critical that MR sites thoughtfully develop clear and site-appropriate procedures in the event of a fire in Zone 3 or Zone 4. The first thing that often comes to mind when one thinks of a fire in MR is quenching the magnet. As we will see shortly, with an active fire, particularly in Zone 4, quenching the magnet should probably not be the first option. With an active fire in MRI, an important action is to remove electrical power to the equipment. This is done by activating an emergency power-off switch or button. This will remove all electrical power to all equipment in both Zone 3 and Zone 4. As part of the planning and training, it's important that all Level 2 MR personnel know the location of both the emergency power off button or switch and the quench button and that they understand the difference between the two. If a fire occurs in Zone 3, it's imperative to evacuate and secure Zone 4. This is done to prevent any responding personnel from entering Zone 4. We recommend holding fire drills at least annually and include all responding departments and personnel. This serves several purposes. First, this ensures that MR personnel know their assigned duties and function in the event of a fire. 
And secondly, it's important that non-MR personnel understand that level two MR personnel are in complete control of who and what comes into the MRI area. MR security and access controls are not suspended in the event of a fire. The ACR recommends training for first responders, in particular fire and police personnel, so that they can understand the dangers encountered in MRI. Here are two examples of emergency power off, also known as EPO, and quench buttons. One should not assume all MR personnel know the difference between the two or even their location. For example, some EPO buttons are located on a wall while some may be part of the operator keyboards or console. It is our experience that quench buttons vary greatly in appearance by MR equipment vendor. Some are located outside zone four, others are located in zone four, and we've even seen buttons within both zones three and four. Depending upon the location of the quench button, it's important to ensure that it cannot be easily activated inadvertently. One client told us of a quench that occurred when an anesthesia cart was pushed up against the wall where the quench button was located. It was just at the right height where a portion of the cart depressed the quench button. I personally always prefer some type of cover over the button that has to be raised or removed before it can be activated. The ACR recommends that when a fire alarm or any other emergency alarm for that matter occurs, it be forwarded to designated level two MR personnel. This is to allow them to respond and assist in maintaining control of the MRI environment. With regard to a quench, only designated and trained individuals should be involved in the decision to quench a magnet, particularly in the event of an active fire in MRI. Now, while helium gas is not flammable, it is cold enough to liquefy the atmosphere, which, as we will see, can increase the danger. The ACR recommends giving consideration to training a few in-house security persons, perhaps one per shift, with regard to the dangers of quenching a magnet and the importance of securing the site and the area until MRI personnel can arrive. We just mentioned that a quench could potentially increase the danger if it were to be performed with an active fire in zone four, and here's why. Remember that helium will boil at 4.2 Kelvin. Air, or atmosphere, is gonna liquefy at approximately 82 Kelvin. So helium rushing through the quench pipes is cold enough to liquefy the atmosphere, or the oxygen. The images you see here are from a video that you can find in the resource section, and you can also find it on YouTube. In, in this video, a professor giving a lecture pours liquid oxygen onto a cotton ball and then puts a flame to it. And as you can see, the result is quite significant. This photo is from another video that you'll find in the resource section. It is from a video taken during a planned quench at an imaging center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. At the end of the video, liquefied atmosphere can be seen dripping from a light fixture in the ceiling. As with the other video, these would be good to use for first responder training. And here's our next uh, audience poll question. Does your facility hold annual training for first responders, specifically firefighters? The choices are yes, annually, yes, but not regularly, or no. Go ahead and make your selection and then press submit. And here are the answers to the question. For the final portion of this webinar, we want to look at managing patient anxiety and MRI. It's not uncommon for patients to be anxious when presenting for an MRI exam. There are many possible reasons. Understandably, they may have fear or dread about the possible diagnosis. 
A past life experience regarding a medical exam may also contribute to their current level of anxiety. They may be undergoing stressful situations at work, and having to deal with a medical issue possibly adds to that stress. Financial concerns, current family issues, as well as previous traumatic events may also be contributing factors. True claustrophobia is actually fairly rare, affecting approximately 5 to 7% of the population. Claustrophobia is classified as a severe anxiety disorder. Because of this type of anxiety, results in persons with claustrophobia altering their lifestyle to avoid uncomfortable situations. It is unlikely someone who suffers from claustrophobia would even show up for an MR exam. According to one study, moderate distress was reported by up to 65% of patients undergoing an MRI exam. The percentage of patients unable to complete the exam was between 0.7 and 20%. Given that approximately 4 to 30 percent of patients have anxiety-related reactions resulting between 4 to 20 percent refusing the exam, we have to understand how to recognize and manage these situations. There are some basic steps that can be taken with all patients. First, don't ask them if they're claustrophobic during scheduling or list that question on the screening form. This only causes them to begin to worry about their ability to tolerate the exam. I once consulted with a client whose primary concern was the number of patients who were unable to undergo an MRI exam due to what they were reporting as, or as the client was reporting, as claustrophobia. Their own statistics showed that it was as high as 20%. Now, after reviewing and observing their practices, I found that all patients were asked about being claustrophobic, starting with the time the referring physician called to schedule the exam. So altogether, all patients were asked if they were claustrophobic at least three to four times before they were brought into the MRI scan room. You know, eliminating that question from all of their screening reduced their rate of incomplete scans to around 2%. One of the recommendations we like to make to clients is to have the same technologist who performs the verbal and interactive screening be the same technologist who performs the exam. There are two good reasons for this. First, it reduces the chance of a safety issue being missed in a handoff situation. And secondly, it allows the technologist to develop a rapport with the patient, which can help reduce the patient's anxiety, particularly if they feel comfortable with that person performing the exam. Other options include allowing them to visit the facility a few days before their exam so they can see exactly what an MRI machine and facility actually looks like. This is especially helpful if they've never undergone an MRI exam before and their perceptions are based solely on what someone may have told them regarding their own experiences. If feasible, they could bring someone along to stay with them in the room during the exam. Of course, be sure to fully screen and dress that person that's accompanying the patient as well. Take time with an anxious patient during the screening and prep phase. Don't rush them. And above all, listen to them. And during the exam, stay in constant visual and verbal contact with the patient. When you give the patient the communication ball, don't call it an alarm or worse, a panic button. Uh, this may bring a thought into their mind that something bad is going to happen and that obviously can increase anxiety. If necessary, bring the patient out in between sequences. Never refer to the MRI system as a closed MRI machine. And maintain physical contact with the patient while they're being advanced to ISO center. If they are positioned feet first, for example, keep your hand lightly on their shoulder. If they're going in head first, keep your hand on their ankle. Maintain this contact until the table comes to a stop. Many sites utilize music and or video systems. Several MR vendors offer the option of variable ambient lighting for the scan room. Depending on the type of exam, specialized goggles and mirror systems can be utilized that allow a patient to see outside the bore. Additional methods for reducing anxiety that don't require additional equipment include the use of aromatherapy, an eye pillow or cool cloth can be placed over their eyes. And if possible, position the patients 
fee first are prone. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. We want to thank MetroSense for the opportunity to present this information to you. And as a reminder, there is additional material for you in the resource area accompanying the presentation. So thank you once again. And we'll turn it back over to Colin. Many thanks, Bill and Kristen. Some great insights and guidance there. So just before we move to the questions, I just want to ask everyone, please provide us with feedback on this webinar. At the, uh, the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey to complete. Please just click on the, uh, uh, on the, on the scores. Uh, and also, please do suggest any subjects that you'd like us to cover in, in future webinars. Many thanks for that. So you've been asking lots of questions while Bill and Kristen were speaking, so now let's see how many we can address. Uh, if you haven't asked your question yet, please do so. If we don't manage to get to yours now, we'll be sure to follow up on offline. So the first question that we've been asked is, what's your opinion on MR tech monitoring patients? I can go ahead and address that question. Um, it's, it's a great question. I will say that um, in x-ray school, all technologists are trained on how to take vital signs. And this is something that we have to become proficient in. So when it comes to monitoring a patient in MRI, many times there's a lot of questions that surround that and whose responsibility is it. We are all trained or should be trained on how to monitor, to watch a pulse ox, if necessary, but I think that your facility needs to look at how they want to address it. I have seen in many facilities that the policy and procedure is to have technologists place a pulse ox on a patient's finger when they are administering contrast. And the technologist knows what the upper and lower limits are. They look for you know, a great change and then they see if it's fallen off or if the patient needs attention. But at these facilities, they have strong training um, that procedures that they follow to make sure that the technologists that are going to be doing monitoring are prepared for that. So that's what I would recommend. Whatever your scope may be, then make sure that you're trained appropriately for your facility. Thanks, Kristen. Next one. How would facilities handle situations where there is only one tech and the patient codes or has some other type of emergency like a seizure? I'll take um, that one too. Okay. Yeah. You want? No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I think that's a great question. It's, it's quite common. I think that you need to have a sound policy and procedure in place. If your facility has um, tech aids, if you have other um, x-ray technologists, ultrasound technologists that are in the area, nurses, any type of designated staff, it's very important um, that these persons that are going to be assisting you, because if you have a patient that is decelerating, they're going to need to be moved from zone four to a designated area. Any persons that are defined as the assistant to the MR tech that is working alone needs to be troubled, trained to a level two MR safety level because they will be operating with you and helping to assist within zone four. So that's very important to make sure that they are trained to that level. Um, I think it, that should probably it, answer that question. Yeah, let me just add that that's what we've seen in a lot of facilities, or at least that's what we've recommended, that uh, the ACR says you need to, in non-emergent situations, you need to have two people within the immediate area. And so uh, we've worked with clients where they would uh, train other personnel who were in the immediate area so that they could come in the MR and assist without presenting a danger. And that's really the important thing. Have a plan, train, and practice it. Thanks, both. Subject now. 
when would you choose to quench the magnet if there's a fire in the scan room? The um, start with that one. Uh, this is also a good question. The if, if you recall from the presentation, you know, when you if you have an active fire in the scan room and you do quench a magnet, um, you could very likely get a uh, liquefied atmosphere dripping into the room. Uh, we have a video of not a fire, but actually a quench and liquefied atmosphere dripping in the room. We showed a steel frame from it. I would encourage you to look at that video that's in the resources, and you, you can see it dripping. The reality is, and this is why you need to train the first responders so that they understand the dangers. Uh, the reality is if a firefighter is going to want into a room, they're going to be able to get in the room. I've heard it said that they have a universal key called a crowbar, and they'll get into pretty much any room. Um, they just need, if somebody's going to insist on going into that room, then it has to be quenched. Uh, they can't go in there with those um, with their backpack on. Again, I go back to what we said in a variety of situations. The, uh, it, it's important to have a clearly defined plan, everybody know it, and that you train the first responders. If you don't train them uh, and nobody does anything until the disaster occurs, it's a disaster on top of the disaster. Nope. What is considered immediately available for the radiologist to respond to a contrast reaction? Um, if someone is um, immediately, go ahead, Bill. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't think you were going to answer. So go ahead. No, I can answer it. Um, if someone, <laughs> um, if a patient starts to decelerate, um, immediately available means very clearly that you have a position that can be interrupted. They can be interruptible. So they can come and immediately assist you with the patient that is having the emergency. If you don't have that in place, then it's not a sound policy and procedure that would, uh, that would be, that would be good. I've heard it said, um, actually in a conversation with Dr. Uh, Manny Canal, uh, and just to quote something or tell you something he told me, uh, based on legal, some legal cases, uh, when you're looking at a response time greater than about a minute and a half, then uh, the site's going to have problems. In my experience from, a, from handling some legal, working with some legal cases, uh, people get sued and lose not because they have an emergent event or adverse event, but they get sued and lose because they don't uh, respond to it. But the jury feels is not quick enough, uh, and, and that's where the danger can come into play. Okay, thanks both for that. What have you found to be the most successful method for an anxious patient? And I'd like to add another question onto that as well. We've got a, a very similar question asking, uh, you recommended that you don't mention claustrophobia or question the patient on claustrophobia. Can you, can you elaborate on why that is? Absolutely. So Bill and I believe that successful completions of exams start with the tech creating a rapport during the live and interactive screening process with the patient. We believe that the patient that is screened by the tech, that tech should be the one who actually completes the scan. Um, make sure that the screening form does not ask the patient if they are claustrophobic. Um, the schedulers do not ask them on the phone. This actually presents in their mind that they might be claustrophobic, so it creates this anxiety from the beginning. That's why we recommend not to put it out there. Um, Make sure that you listen and answer all their questions. Um, one thing that we run into quite often is that people call the communication ball that they squeeze if they want to talk to you. They'll say, oh, you know, if you need something or if you, you panic, just, you know, press that, you know, panic button. And that insinuates to the patient, well, I might have a situation where I would panic. What would create that anxiety? And so that puts it into their mind. It's always a good idea to keep physical contact with the patient as you move them toward ISO Center. 
your hand on their shoulder if they're going in feet first, hand on the lower leg for head first. Basically, don't just press ISO center and walk out the room to start the exam. Um, as the ACR recommends, you know, continually communicate between sequences with verbal and visual contact with the patient at all times. Aromatherapy, uh, using the certain oils, lavender, et cetera, that not only calms them, but actually it refocuses their energy so they're concentrating on breathing rather than the exam that's actually happening to them. It's also great if you have it to have the goggles, the music, and our video systems, but the other things we just talked about are things that you don't have to invest money to be successful with. Let me just add that I personally have had experience using aromatherapy uh, in one of my last real jobs that I had, and I did a little informal, uh, have an informal tracking of it, uh, very informal. But out of the uh, out of the people that were requested at the time of scheduling or something for medication, and this is back in the day when we used to give out Valium like candy, but be that as it may, for out of the number of people that were requested or asked to have something, I was able to get approximately 80% of those people done without having to give them anything, just using aromatherapy. And to Kristen's point, it causes them to focus their attention on something, and I think that's a big part of, of what helps with it as well. So I've had a good luck with aromatherapy. Thank you very much. Okay, so how, how often should staff practice urgent removal of an unwell patient from the magnet room? Well, I think we uh, mentioned in the in the video uh, presentation there that at least at least once a year, uh, if not um, twice a year. Uh, I noticed in the poll numbers that it was, if I'm not mistaken, over 50 percent either uh, didn't do it, didn't do it at all, or, or rarely did it. Um, it was the same way with training first responders. It's like, again, if you don't have a plan for this, when the unexpected happens, it's, uh, as we say down south, becomes a dumpster fire, and it's, it's just, you know, a disaster on top of itself. Yeah, I will say that I've seen one solid policy at a facility which they practice twice a year. If a patient decelerates, the technologist, and one other designated person that are working together go into the room. And as they're walking into the room to do the emergent removal of the patient, they point to someone and they say, block my door. And that is to prevent anyone else, because everyone wants to rush to zone four, that is to prevent people that might have unwanted items to go into zone four from going in there as the two designated people will take the patient to the pre-designated area for treatment. So, it needs to be muscle memory, and so you need to practice it more often, you know, the more the better. And not just for emergent removal of the patient, but also for fire drills and how those things are handled, you know, so on and so forth. One of the things that I want to reiterate that I'm pretty sure we said in there was that uh, you need to involve uh, the other departments. And that, again, is so they know what they can and can't do but it also has to be very clearly driven into their minds that they do not come into MR and all of a sudden begin to run things, that the MR personnel have to maintain control of that environment at all times. And that's part of involving them in that so that they understand that. Thanks very much. We've had lots of questions around uh, the number of staff required for different types of facilities. Um, I'll, I'll pick one, just got time for one of these questions, but also asking about sole working as well. So the first question is, what's the staffing requirement for two magnets sharing the same zone three? This was in a sort of in, in a hospital that deals with inpatients and outpatients. And then we also have a, a number of questions on what about uh, facilities where you have technologists working alone? Okay, so 
If you have two scanners, the ACR wants the uh, recommends that the technologist have you know verbal and visual contact with their patient at all times. So that would lead to the recommendation of yes, one technologist per scanner when you're sharing a zone three. In the event that you have an emergency, it's going to be very important that you have somebody additional to help because the second technologist should not be leaving their patient to come and assist you in an emergency. So having something like a tech aid, someone that's designated and trained to level two so they can assist you, someone like that needs to be defined and who will take that role within your facility because it would not be um, creating a safe atmosphere if you were just to have two technologists without someone in addition. That's good. Um, I, I mean, reiter I just would want to reiterate that the tech aid thing is, is something that I think can work very well. Now, there are sites that um, – I got an interesting email from somebody the other day that said they had a – consulting group come in and tell them that they could work very well with just one tech on the MR and one tech on CT. And my response was, I'm sure that consulting firm only had one person working on that report, which, you know, they didn't. Um, and, yes, you can work with one person on MR and one person on CT or whatever, and you can also haul gravel in a Corvette, too. It's just not recommended. And the problem is going to be, all works fine until somebody gets sick or somebody has a seizure or a heart attack or anything like that, a medical emergency, we tend to forget it's an actual medical procedure. And uh, I, unfortunately, I don't think uh, people, I know people who are not in MRI don't see it. We get it because we're medical personnel. But uh, again, I think if you're going to be working alone, you've got to have a plan. I think you need to force back on management. So what happens when something goes wrong? How do you, how do you, if your table doesn't undock, how are you going to get that patient out of the magnet? You can't call for moving help. Plan, plan, plan. This, this is what sites don't do. They just throw their hands up, I think, and say, well, they're not going to give us any help. You know, and unfortunately, that's very dangerous. Thanks, Bill. Um, we've only got time now for another couple of questions, I think. Um, one specific, you showed some uh, some photographs of um, incidents caused, causing burns, and we've got a question. Do you know if the burns from the electrodes had the wires attached? My, that uh, picture was given to me by Frank Shellock, and no, the wires weren't attached but it doesn't matter if they were. They, if they were attached, they shouldn't have been on there at all. And, but no, the wires weren't attached. Um, but those were, again, ECG electrodes that came down from the floor with the patient. According to Frank Shellock, that occurred at the hospital where Frank was born, uh, which is kind of ironic. But at any rate, it really doesn't matter whether the leads are on it or not. Bottom line is, you don't want anything going into that magnet that you don't need and that you don't know what it is, and it's not designed specifically for the MRI environment. Um, again, I don't care if the nursing staff wants to leave the, le the electrodes on. They're not staying on um, when I go to put them in the magnet. Thank you. If there's an emergency or a fire in the middle of the night and no one is working, who do you designate to quench the magnet if required? Um, let me go ahead and do that one because I actually, for some reason, I can't remember, I was working on something and I was looking through the ACR guidance document and stuff and I actually have something that addresses this. Um, and it's, it's multifaceted, quite honestly. Number one, uh, go back to you've got to have a training for first responders so they understand the dangers that are inherent in the environment. Uh, the ACR recommends consideration, and I think this is actually a good idea, consideration be given to uh, training one, at least one, no more than a couple, security personnel on each shift to be able to maintain control of that environment until MRI personnel can get there or it can be determined what they're going to have to do. 
rather than just leave it up to the security department at night to go in there and you know they're going to make a disaster out of it. Um, but I do think it's a good idea uh, to train uh, a security personnel, like I said, maybe one on each shift, but certainly during the nighttime if nobody's there, to know that they can't just walk into that room. That they've got to control access. The ACR also recommends sending out the alarm simultaneously to pre-designated level two personnel so that they can try to get there as soon as possible or at least communicate with people as to what they can do. But I think getting someone trained to just maintain control of that room is, is extremely important. Many thanks, Bill. Well, I, unfortunately, that's as much time as we've got. Um, there are lots of questions that you've submitted that we haven't actually managed to get to yet, but we will, as previous webinars, um, answer those offline and, uh, and make sure everyone gets a response to those. Thank you very much, obviously, to, to Bill and Kristen. I think that was an absolutely fabulous and very informative uh, hour, and I'm sure everyone online uh, shares that thought as well. Um, for everyone who's joined us today, um, I'd ask you, please, once the, uh, the survey pops up at the end of the webinar, please do give us your response to that. And, uh, and obviously, you can continue to, or you can come back and, and watch this online uh, on demand if you wish. Uh, please pass the link on to any of your colleagues who weren't able to join us today. Thank you very much, and please do also watch out for the uh, for the next uh, webinar coming up from MetroSense, which will be just uh, in a few weeks' time now, and uh, and you'll be receiving an email uh, very shortly telling you all the details of that. So, last many thanks to Kristen and uh, and Bill, and uh, look forward to uh, joining you all next time. Thank you.